coming to you from the Deep South. This is the Blue Collar Leadership Podcast. High impact leadership is not reserved for leaders, and it has nothing to do with your position, title, or rank. However, it does have everything to do with your character. It's time to climb to the next level and beyond, personally and professionally. Now, let's start making it happen with your host, Max Story. Thanks for stopping by the Blue Collar Leadership Podcast today. Today, the the topic is going to be anger management. I'm going to tell you some stories about me. I'm going to tell you some lessons that I've learned, some principles that I've applied to to move myself beyond having an anger problem. But but believe me, if you knew me back when I was younger, my late teens, all throughout my 20s, well into my 30s, if you knew me, you'd know I had an anger problem, big time. Poster child. Imagine a chihuahua on acid with a machine gun. That was me. If you know those little chihuahuas, <laughs> they go crazy. And it's a good thing they're not like the size of a lion or a tiger because the world would be a different place if you had a, chi- a chihuahua that size. Be some crazy things happening. But, you know, they're small. So I always make that joke when Rhea and I travel around the country and when I talk about this subject, and when I start talking about it, you know, telling people how angry I used to get, she always says, I, I don't think they understand. You, you need to paint them a picture. That's the picture I always paint. Chihuahua on acid with a machine gun. You know, some kind of mind-altering drug. You make them even crazier than they were to start with. That, that used to be me. I'd be the nicest guy you ever knew one second, and I could be the craziest guy you ever saw the, the next second. I mean, instantly. Snap your fingers that quick over nothing. Many, many times it was over nothing. So that's what I want to talk to you about today is anger management. I know I'm not the only person in the world has problems with anger management. You have seen people at red lights before. Got to turn signal on, want to turn red. I mean, turn right on red. Lights red. Someone's in front of them, though. They got their turn signal on to go right. Nothing's coming. These folks are not turning. Although they could, they're just not doing it. The second the second car, and it used to be me sometimes, but I still see it. The second car gets angry. They honk their horn, or they yell, or they stick their finger out the window, and then finally the light will turn green, and the car in front of them will finally go, and, and they'll drive past them, and sometimes they say something. Sometimes they holler something out the window. Sometimes they stick their fingers out the window. I mean, it, it gets ugly sometimes. And then they barrel off down the road all angry and mad. You know, because they had to sit behind this car for like 20, 30 seconds. <laughs> aren't, aren't we interesting creatures? People go completely ballistic. And again, I used to be one of them because they had to wait somewhere for 20 or 30 seconds. It doesn't even make sense to me now, but I see it all the time and I know how it is because I've been there. But what I learned, and, and Rhea, my wife, I, I talk about this a lot, and, and I've written about this stuff in some of my books. Uh, I got a, a, a chapter on the power of the pause button in my Blue Collar Leadership Leading from the Front Lines book. I talk about my anger issues and overcoming them in uh, my book, 10 Foundational Elements of Intentional Transformation, How to Become Your Best Self. And I, I write a lot about it. The goofy things I did and the stupid things I did and anger and stuff like that. It, it, there's a good bit of that also in my book, Defining Influence. Uh, increasing your influence increases your options. So those are three resources. But Rhea told me, she said, when we when we speak, you say a lot of things you hadn't written in the books. And, and a lot of those things I have learned to talk about and speak about since I wrote it in the books and started really talking about it. I've learned to tell certain stories to help people understand it better. And maybe to, to control their anger better. So Rio is like, you need to you need to do a podcast on that. Tell some of those stories that you tell when we're traveling. I mean, we we travel sometimes speaking. We've traveled through as many as forty states in a single year, uh, speaking about personal growth and leadership development. Pretty much, if you ever hear me speak, I'm going to talk about what I'm talking about today, because it's the greatest lesson I ever learned. Allowed me to 
correct my anger problem. And, and that lesson, I've taught it in previous episodes, but I'm going to teach it again today. And then I'm going to tell some new stories maybe that I haven't told before. Either way, I'm going to wrap it in an entirely new package, so to speak, to create this episode on anger management. Haven't done one literally on that, although I talk about it quite often. But that greatest lesson I ever learned was from Dr. Covey, Seven Habits. And I, I learned it in 2008. W- within the first five or ten minutes, I had never heard anything about personal growth and development. Leadership development. Never heard it. Never heard any audios, any videos. Never read a book. Never heard nothing. Till 2008. When, when this audio started playing, it was on my iPod that a friend had, had, had given me. Or he actually loaded a bunch of music on my iPod in 2005. And he told me, I put a business book on there for you, Mac. I said, okay, what is it? He said, seven habits of highly effective people. I said, is it, is, is it any good, Zach? He said, I don't know, man. I never listened to it. I said, okay. He said, but my friend's dad said it was really good. And and that's where he had got the music from his friend's computer. And I guess the song was on there. I mean, the uh, the audio book, an hour, an hour. Uh, found out it was an hour highlight version of the complete audio book that I didn't know existed at the time, which is probably 12 or 13 hours. But I just got a one hour, you know, highlight version that Zach had had uh, given me back then. So it, fast forward three years, I hadn't listened to it, but I started my own business in 2008, driving around, you have my iPod, my iPod plugged in to my stereo, music blaring, trying to find some clients. I was in business, but I didn't have any business. So I'm just driving around, trying to talk to people, having meetings, those sort of things. And then the uh, guy just started talking. One song went off, and then all of a sudden, a guy started talking, which was weird. And I looked at the stereo to see what it was because, you know, it was printing, printing, printing it out on there. He told me it's seven habits of highly effective people. And I had that flashback to Zach three years before. It's like, oh, Zach gave me that. He told me it was a business book. I started my own business. I don't have any business. Maybe I should listen to it. So I just let it play. And again, this was my first exposure to any of this type stuff. So... He starts talking. He says a couple of things, and and pretty quick, he starts teaching about the seven habits. Habit one, he said, was be proactive. To be proactive means we respond based on our values, assuming you got some some values and you know what they are, and you're trying to live in alignment with them. And he said to, to understand it, the best way to understand it is to understand the opposite of to be proactive. So the opposite of being proactive is to be reactive. And people who are reactive respond based on emotions and not values. You know, and it was all making sense what he was saying. And then then he says, let me, let me help you understand. He said, between stimulus and response, human beings have the freedom to choose their response. And I hit pause. And I said to myself, this, this joker does not know Mac's story. I don't have the freedom to choose my response. That's what I was thinking to myself because I literally hit pause and I literally thought about that because I had a super, super short temper. I mean, instant. Go from the nicest guy you ever met to the craziest guy you ever met instantly over nothing. You know, and this guy's telling me between stimulus and response, something happens, we respond we have the freedom to pause in between stimulus and response, something happening, us responding. We have the freedom to pause, choose our response. First of all, I started thinking I, I couldn't do it, but I was thinking I ain't never thought about that. But he doesn't know me. That ain't That's not going to happen. So I rewound it once I got through thinking about that, and, and I hit play and let it catch back up and, he says it again, between stimulus and response, human beings have the freedom to choose their response. Obviously, said it again because I had to rewound it because I wanted to hear it again. And then I had another thought. So I hit pause again. I still didn't get any farther than I had the first time. I hit pause and and I thought about this time. You know, first I thought he doesn't know me. I can't do that. But the second time, I thought, 
is that really true? Since I had got the other thoughts out of the way, now I can think about something different. So I thought, is that really true? And then I validated it was true. I thought about times in my life where I had wanted to get angry either with my parents or the law or a school teacher, a boss, plenty of times in my life, a spouse, a child, a stranger, a coworker. Plenty of times I had validated it when I wanted to get angry and I didn't. So as soon as, as, soon as I thought about that, I was like, well, he's right. You, you have the freedom to choose your response because I had, I had gotten it right sometimes and I had gotten it wrong. Either way, it was a response. I chose to get it wrong or I chose to get it right. I chose to stay calm or I chose to go crazy. Most often, though, I just go crazy. But sometimes I had got it right, which means I actually could do it. So now I had validated I could do it. So I rewound again, let it play past that. And, and then he says, between stimulus and response, we have the freedom to choose our response. He said that means we're response able. It's kind of like I'm holding out two hands, both of my hands, right? In my right hand, I have response. In my left hand, I have able. And when I talk about this on stage, I do it like that. I hold my hands out. Right hand, response. Left hand, able. I said what that means is, and then I slide my hands together because initially they're kind of spread apart. So as I'm saying this, I slide them together, and I'm doing it right now. That means we're responsible. Being responsible, slide that together, make one word out of it. It means we're responsible. And I was like, wow. I had always said short temper runs in my family. And all my family said short temper runs in my family. And all you had to do is hang around us long enough, and we'd absolutely provide the evidence to support our belief. But in that moment, literally, I had figured out I had the freedom to choose my response no matter what happened. I bought into what he was saying. That means that we're responsible, which means we're responsible. So what I learned in that moment was short temper does not run in my family. Irresponsibility runs in my family. It might run in your family too. But you can choose to be responsible, but you have to want to. And as I started growing and developing and reading more, because in 2008, that very moment I'm telling you about, it was the beginning of me reading every day or listening to audio of this type every day or watching a video every day. I do something like that every day. Most Mostly it's reading because I, I, hate, I hate to read, but I figured out I like to read more than I hate to learn. And, and reading is actually allows me to stop, slow down, back up, go forward. Same thing I was telling you I was doing with the audio that day. It's a little simpler when I'm looking at a page of, of a book, whether it's electronic or a hard, you know, hard co cover traditional paper paperback uh, book, whichever type it is. But that's what happened. It changed my life. I don't get angry anymore. But I guarantee you I got angry that same day, and I got angry the next day. And like I said, I've, <clears throat> excuse me, I've, I've been, I had anger problems through my 20s, and this was 2008, you know, when I heard this. In 2008, when I heard this, I was 39 years old, so I had already been through my late teens, my 20s, and most of my 30s. I had one year left in my 30s, and I still had an anger problem. But that's the day I started working on it. That's the day I started getting rid of it. That's the day I started leading myself better on purpose. And again, I've been reading, learning, studying that type of content every day now, almost 14 years now. My life's completely different. I'm completely different. I'm able to teach you this lesson because I learned that lesson, but I didn't learn it by hearing it. I learned it by applying it. And it took me a while. I mean, it took me years. Probably, I would say, it took me from 2008 it probably took somewhere between two to four years, somewhere in that second to fourth years, really when I started making some progress. And by 2012, I, I was in pretty good shape then. 
and I've, I've held my own now. I don't, I don't get angry. About the worst thing you see me do, do is, is I get quiet. And depending on how angry I am on the inside, I might be quiet, be quiet for a minute, five minutes, five hours, a couple of days. But I just keep it in. I don't let it out. That's not the best thing to do. There's better things to do. But it's better than going ballistic and going crazy and doing stupid things or tearing up things or causing myself or somebody else problems. So sometimes the best thing I can do is be quiet. But I can do that. I can keep it to myself. I don't have to take it to the outside world. Huge, huge improvement. But I don't really go through that that often anymore. Most of the time now, I just don't get angry and I, I don't put myself in positions to get angry and I think at an entirely different level and I have a different level of awareness. But we are response able. See, when you're when you're proactive, you respond based on values and you got to have some values and and figure out what they are and try to align with those values. And that's what happened when I started reading and learning and growing. I started to align my behavior around a certain set of values. You decide what those are for you. But for me, I want to increase positive influence with as many people as possible. Possible. I want to, you know, at the time, I want to quit hanging out with the negative people, start hanging out with the positive people. Well, positive people don't want to hang out with people with anger management problems. So I had to work on that so that I could be, start attracting positive people into my life and start repelling negative people out of my life. What I call today, toxic people. I was a toxic person to many people back then. And as I started growing, I became less toxic and I didn't want toxic people in my life. Those people who like to see me get angry. A lot of people used to try to, you know, instigate me getting angry, especially at work because they like to watch the show. I'm sure it was very entertaining. You know, I'm a little guy. I'm 5'7". And back back in my teens, today I weigh about 165, 170. So I still ain't really that big of a guy, but... You know, when I was younger, I was when I got out when I graduated Paris Island, 1987 uh, boot camp, headed off to Camp Geiger near Camp Lejeune for infantry school. I weighed like 128 pounds or something. I was like a little guy, but I was crazy. That's one reason I went into Marines. One reason I went into the infantry. I liked all that crazy stuff. I graduate graduated with meritorious promotion from from boot camp. Even though I was a little guy, I graduated second in my platoon and. A uh, guy that beat me out was a big old muscled up dude who had been in uh, ROTC program in college, and he he deserved to be number one. And I probably surprised a lot of folks by being in number two in my platoon. But anyway, I I'm in a completely different place. But reactive people, they respond based on emotions. And the wrong emotions, bad emotions, can be very bad leaders. You know, good emotions are good leaders. But bad emotions are bad leaders. You know, sadness, frustration, anger, those type of emotions, uh, they'll lead you down the wrong path. So if you want to be proactive, you're going to respond based on values. If you want to be reactive, you're going to react based on emotions. So you got to start, you know, thinking about it on purpose. So I was telling this story one time, Rhea and I were speaking up, we were speaking to a, a, a paving company. Uh, uh, we were actually speaking in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. The paving company has multiple locations around the, the Northeast up there. But we were speaking at that particular day, we were uh, doing a four hour session and we took a break about halfway through about two hours in, we took a break and during the break, a guy kind of come charging up the middle of the aisle. And he was a, you know, what I call a, you know, a roughneck blue collar guy. You could tell he was hard, hardcore blue collar guy, my, my kind of people. And, uh, but he was charging down the aisle. You know, there was a bunch of white collar type folks in there too, some upper level leaders in that organization. But there was some frontline leaders who hadn't been off of the front line themselves very long. And, and this guy looked like one of those guys, and he's charging down the aisle. He's a big dude. And I'm thinking, what in the world is this guy up to? And he kind of comes charging down there, and he points his finger at me. He says, you should be a doctor. And I, it didn't even register. I mean, I didn't, 
I knew he said you should be, but a doctor didn't register. I didn't know what he said. Nobody ever told me I should be a doctor. But that's what he said. He said, he said it again, you should be a doctor. I said, what's your name, man? He said, my name's Larry. I said, all right, Larry, what, what are you talking about? He said, man, I've been in trouble my whole life. I've been in, in, in the pen, in prison. He said, I've been had an anger manage, management problems my whole life. He said, and uh, when I got out of prison, I had to go to counseling. And the first time I went, I got in trouble. I reached over the table and, and grabbed a guy up by his, his collar and yanked him across the table and got in some more trouble and just had got out of prison. And he said, but what you said earlier in this session, he said, I've been in front of all kind of doctors in my life because of my anger problem. He said, none of them have ever told me what you told me. You told all of us, but I'm saying you told me. And it's what I needed to hear to get to work on my anger problem. He said, so that's why I'm saying you should be a doctor. Because I've talked to a whole lot of doctors who ain't ever told me that. And maybe it's because they ain't ever had that kind of anger problem Max Story has had. Because I had an anger problem. Probably much worse than you. Even if you think you got a bad one, mine was probably worse. So for me to be where I am today, I had to learn a lot. I probably learned a lot more than people who have a, a, a degree that makes them a doctor. Because, you know, they, they learned it from reading a book, most of them. I, I learned it from transforming myself. I had to do the hard work. I had to do the stuff they, they write about in the books. And it was hard. And I did it because I wanted to, not because somebody was making me. But anyway, so I had told the audience what I've told you so far on this podcast. But I had said something else, though, that Larry really got the value from. He got the value from the first part. But the part I'm about to share with you is the part that Larry got out of it. And it's the same thing because, you know, when I was telling the lessons I've already told you, when I'm speaking on the stage or in front of the crowd, I'll say, you know, someone asked me one time, and it's kind of how we got there. Someone asked me one time, how, how did you really change? understand what you're teaching me, but how did you actually change? What caused you to change? In between my learning and applying and changing, I, I figured out what I'm about to tell you. But, but when I truly, back those days, when I figured it out, when I'm, when I'm about to tell you connected in my mind, it got easy. Up to then, it had been hard. But it got easy after that. And it got easy for Larry. And maybe it'll get easy for you if you got any anger problems. And it's a good chance you do, because most of us do. We're Most of the time, if you want to know somebody with an anger problem, you just meet somebody. Most people have them. Some of us have them way, way, way worse than others. Pretty much everybody has a little bit of one. It's, it's kind of on a scale. It might be just a little bit, or it might be a whole lot. So what I had told Larry that day after I taught him what I taught you, is I said, let me explain to y'all what I learned that actually allowed me to truly harness my anger issue. I said, I, I grew up the kind of person, and I'm still that person today. I'm still the same way. But I grew up, I never in my life wanted somebody to control me. And I'm telling you today, while I'm recording this podcast, I still don't. I don't want nobody on this planet controlling me, trying to control me. I don't like it. Back when I was young, I, I really didn't like it either. And the best way to get people to leave you alone is go crazy. Unless they're crazier than you. And fortunately for me, I never met anybody who was crazier than me. They've got to be out there. But I was so far up on the list that they wasn't many because I never met one of them. If I would have, I'd have killed him or her or he or she would have killed me. But lucky for me, everybody always left me alone. They quit. I would never quit. And I never met anybody who wouldn't quit. Everybody would always quit. So it's kind of like I was the last one standing. I was more crazy, more whatever you want to call it. I don't know. I'm a little guy, but you just got to understand it was it was different. Remember, Chihuahua on acid with a machine gun. And I literally, back in my early 20s, after I got out of boot camp infantry school, I had an AR-15, heavy barrel, counter sniper uh style 
uh, AR-15, had a scope on it, cheap piece, came in an aluminum case. I had six 30-round magazines, kept them in that aluminum case, took that thing with me everywhere I went, not because I wanted to bother somebody else, but if somebody bothered me, I wasn't going to lose. And it was always there. I was crazy. But eventually I sold it and got rid of that thing. And, you know, I'm better now. But uh, <laughs> the way the world's going crazy, I might need one literally. Not because I'm crazy anymore, because there's a lot of other crazy folks out there. But I ain't really talking about that lesson today. But what I learned, and this is the lesson, the key point that Larry got, that I got, is I don't want somebody to control me. And I asked the audience that day, I say, have you ever, have you ever had anybody try to make you angry? They wanted to push your buttons, flip your switch. They wanted to make you angry. And they were doing their best, but you got it right. You may not know why you got it right, or you might not did it on purpose, but you got it right. You didn't get angry. And I'll ask the audience, what happened to them? And usually instantly, multiple people at the same time will say they got angry. I say, that's all you need to know to validate what I'm about to teach you. I say, why did they get angry? Usually, again, two or three people instantly will say, because I didn't get angry. I say, you're exactly right. Somebody tried to make you angry, but you didn't get angry. So they got angry. They got angrier than they were because you didn't get angry. Why did they get angry? They got angry because they were trying to control you. And since you didn't get angry because they were trying to make you angry, you didn't allow them to control you. I said that day, and I'm saying it now, when I figured that out, oh, it got easy for me not to get angry. Because listen to me again, I, I don't like people to control me. I don't. I really don't like it. I can't say it more honest and straight up than that. I don't like somebody trying to control me. So when somebody's trying to make me angry, why on this planet would I hand control over to them on a silver platter? Because when somebody tried to make me get angry and I get angry, they win. They're controlling me. That is the last thing on the planet that I want. I don't want somebody controlling me. I'm just here to tell you, when you let somebody get you angry, if you really don't want to be angry, if you value controlling yourself instead of someone else controlling you, when you get angry, you're giving control of yourself over to those people on a silver platter which is fine you're absolutely free to do that but if you're going to do that you can't say I don't like people to control me because it ain't the truth if you're handing control of yourself over on a silver platter by getting angry well you, you're out of alignment with reality you can't say you don't like it if you're going to hand it over you can't say I don't like people to control me if I'm going to allow them to control me. So as soon as all that connected to me, it was like two train cars on a train track connecting. I mean, I locked on to that principle. And I don't think anybody taught me that. I, I put all that together and came up with that little story and told myself. And then I started telling other people. And that's why Rhea wanted me to tell you today. She said, you need to tell that on your podcast. So that's why I'm here. Larry, Larry made such an impact on me. And later, we went back the next year and talked again. And I talked to him later through Facebook, I think it was, or maybe even on the phone. And he said he actually got better. And, and even the day when he talked to me, some people who worked with him told me some stories about Larry. And they said, Larry needed to get your lesson that you talked today. And some of those people were the ones I asked the next year because I don't think Larry was there the second time. I really can't remember now. I don't think so, but uh, maybe he was. But either way, I talked to some some of the bosses there, and they said that he got a lot better after that. He was working on it. He got results. So if you got an anger problem, I hope you jot down this episode. I hope you hit pause. I hope you hit rewind like I did when I first come across this. I hope my lesson maybe is even better than the lesson I got from Dr. Covey because I'm teaching you an enhanced lesson. 
Dr. Covey, when he taught it to me, he wasn't telling me he had an anger, anger problem. He wasn't telling me he was a cra- crazy chihuahua on acid with a machine gun. <laughs> but that's who I was. I was that guy. So if you know some people with an anger problem, which is most of your coworkers, probably most of your family, potentially, maybe everybody ain't like me, but I, I see a lot of people out there in the world. Share this with them. Talk to you next time. Make it happen or someone else will. It might as well be you. Are you serious about taking your career and your life to the next level and beyond? Check out Max Story's Blue Collar Leadership Series books and others, now available on audio, along with paperback and ebooks at Amazon, iTunes, and Audible. Please visit bluecollarleadership.com to learn about Max books, programs, special offers, certifications, and more. Thank you for listening to the Blue Collar Leadership Podcast.